All right, good afternoon, everybody. Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's Counselor Connect <clears throat> session. This is the third and final session in our comprehensive school counseling series. Um, my name is Amanda Colhan. I am the coordinator for Counselor Connect, and I'm looking forward to um, having our two presenters with us today. If you missed sessions one and two in the series, which were uh, live, <clears throat> excuse me, live, I believe in November and February, those are available on demand in our on-demand library. So if you wanna go back and revisit and access those, you can do so by visiting our, our library on demand. Um, I am thrilled to welcome today's presenters. We have uh, joining us today, Alan Woodruff and Audrey Tenbarge. And both of our presenters are from Evansville. So Alan is a K-12 school counselor at the EVSC Virtual Academy. And Audrey is an eighth grade counselor at the North Junior High School in Evansville. So we are very thrilled to welcome them today. And if they wanna share a little bit more about themselves um, beyond that introduction, they are welcome to do so. But otherwise, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to them to get us started. All right, thank you so much. So like you said, I'm Alan Woodruff. So I've been an educator for six years now, third year as a counselor. Prior to that, I taught for three years at an alternative school here. Um, I am the virtual academy counselor. That's the school we have within our corporation. This is my first year there. I'm in charge of all students, kindergarten through 12th. So I got the whole, the whole show pretty much. Um, so it's very different than where I came from. I came from elementary only, but I've had experience at every level. So this is, this is new to me, excited. Uh, Definitely a different journey, but it's a lot of fun. So I'll let Audrey share a little bit about her. Um, I'm Audrey Timbarch. I am the eighth grade school counselor at North Junior High School. North Junior um, is a school that is grades seventh and eighth grade. We have two school counselors at my school. Um, I've been with the EVSC for 10 years, and this is my third year um, as the counselor at North Junior. Um, Alan and I are both um, also ISCA emerging leaders. Um, my school was also RAMP certified recently. All right, so just a little bit about EVSC before we get started. Um, we're the third largest school district in Indiana. Um, approximately 58% of our students are free and reduced lunch. We do have um, all kinds of different makeups of schools, um, as well as the early childhood le learning program. We are also really lucky to have a lot of innovative models within our school, one of those being the one that Alan teaches at, which is Virtual Academy. So coming from the, the virtual world, and I know Amanda kind of hit on this earlier, anytime we start our presentation virtually with counseling or just our classes, we always remind our students, please mute your microphone. Um, early on, you get to hear all that feedback and static and all that echoing and all that. That's why we ask, make sure you're muted. If you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat. We do have a question and answer time later, but if you have a question and we can answer it right now, we'll be happy to do so. So make sure you're muted. All right, we have three objectives for the day. The first is to understand and utilize different data collection methods. Um, we're also gonna analyze data in order to make decisions regarding appropriate interventions and then understand different ways to share data and those results. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do is we want to hear kind of how you feel about data. So if you could go to menti.com and then we're going to enter a code just to kind of give us an idea of your where you are in regards to data right now. So when you hear or see the word data, how does it make you feel? So if you go to menti.com, the code is up there at the top. And then we're just going to type in some words about how it makes us feel. You can do this from your phone, your computer, anything will work. And feel free to be honest too. Like if you're like, I feel terrified. You can mm -hmm. type in terrified. If you put, you love it, that's fine too. You can put, you love it. Uh, 
All right, if you're unsure how to get to it, just you can go on like any internet browser and you type in menti.com. It's at the very top of the screen, www.menti.com. That works right there. I don't know if you can click it. If you, and then type in that little code and it should pull up boxes. I think there's four. four. You can put up to four answers. You only have one, you can just put one. But super easy, no wrong answers here. Geeked out, that's a good one too. Nauseous. <laughs> Love it. There we go. Somebody loves data. That's good. Guiding, overwhelmed. Overwhelmed is big in the middle. All right, we'll give you guys about another minute just to get it done. If you don't get it done, you can always go back and put it in later, but get this a cool idea of how you really feel about data. I like that I see decision because data is what we use to make decisions. Some good stuff. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> I like the yay. Yeah. <laughs> you might, in your head, if you're like me, you, you're probably wondering is it data or data? You hear, you hear both of them, and that confuses me. The word itself confuses me all the time, just how to say it. All right, so we we'll might come back to this, but if you didn't get a chance to put it in, again, it's in the chat. Go to menti.com, that code. Just tell us how you feel. But So now, as a, as a group, we get a good idea of how everybody feels about it. So let's get back to our presentation. Oh. All right. You probably don't want to see my email. No. Oh, let me click because the thing's in the way. There we go. All right. So we're gonna gonna talk about a couple of different things, like we talked about our objectives. The first thing is collecting data. So if you are familiar with Chris Hatch, um, she's a fantastic presenter, does a lot of great work on school counseling and a lot of great stuff. But this comes from her book. Um, she talks about collecting data. Data ensures every student receives the benefit of a school counseling program that is preventative in design, developmental in nature, and comprehensive in scope. So again, that's for every student, not just one set student. And per the Ask a National Model, they talk about three types of data. It's achievement, attendance, and discipline. And we're kind of going to get into each of those and talk about what they are and what they look like a little bit, and then we'll kind of move on from there. So achievement data. Achievement data is pretty simple and easy. How are students achieving? There's a lot of good ways you can get this through standardized test results, ISTEP, SAT, um, NWEA, all that good stuff. GPA, you can look at students' GPA. If they have 4.0 or use a different scale, you can look at that. If it's low on the scale, you know they're not achieving as well as you like. Again, SAT, ACT scores, and just grades overall. You can just pull grades from any grade level and kind of see how your students are performing and use that data to help you in your next step. You can look at attendance. Attendance, again, that's pretty simple and straightforward. You can look at truancies. How often is the student not at school? Um, how, how often are they late to school? How often are they late to class? Any excused absences even, like if they are constantly turning in doctor's notes and things like that. That might be some data for you that you wanna discuss with that student as well to see what's going on. Or discipline, again, all these data points are super, pretty straightforward and easy to understand. Discipline you're looking at, well, discipline. Um, you can look at office suspensions, how many times a kid's been suspended from school, in school or out of school. You can look at office referrals as a whole. I know some schools use low level, low level or classroom level behaviors. Um, that's something we have within the EVSC. Sometimes a teacher, if a kid's maybe not doing something terrible, you have to send them to the office, but just little things here and there, little disruptions, and the teacher might make notes of that. And on the system we have, sometimes you can track that in our system. Sometimes you can just ask the teacher about that information as well. So those are ways you can tra track data. Again, looking at achievement, attendance, and discipline. I think it's important to note that you can actually pull data from all three sources whenever you're making decisions. It doesn't have to come from 
just one category um, and just using kind of triangulating data with information from all different sources. Yeah. And we're going to get into some examples of that in a little bit. Absolutely. So now that we know a little bit more about kind of the different areas we're going to look at, we're going to have a little bit of fun and we're going to play a game because games are fun and it's, it's spring break for us. I don't know about you guys. We want to have a little bit of fun with you guys. We're going to play Kahoot. I don't know if you've ever played Kahoot before. It's a fantastic thing to do. So here is how this works. So you'll go to kahoot.it, or if you have the Kahoot app, or you can scan that QR code on there, and it'll pull up everything. I can make it a little bit bigger for everybody can see. And I'll put in the chat real quick as well how to get into this. Oh, well, Amanda's already ahead of it. She's, she's beating us. And then once you get there, you'll have to put in a, a PIN code, 250-8213. Then you can put your, your full name, your initials, your real name, smiley face works, anything you want. I don't know how many people are in this thing. I'm sure we have everybody in. All right, we got a few more to we'll wait on. We got 12 total. Thank you. Oh, somebody left us. In the in the chat, there is a link in there. You can click on, make it super easy. Click on that and then put that code in and we'll be set. We'll give you a couple more minutes for those who are trying to get in. And you're going to enter that pin number right up top, 250-8213. All right, we'll give you like one more minute for those still trying to get in. I know we have some. If you can't get in and don't want to play, that's fine. We're not going to force you to play. But you can at least watch the fun. Mm -hmm. All right, we're getting there. All right, we are going to start. If you, if you didn't make it in, it's okay. We we'll, we'll apologize if we leave you out, but just for time, we'll get going here. So let's start the fun. All right, so we're talking about types of data. I'll try and read the question for you out loud. It says, what kind of data looks at the number of office referrals for disruption? What kind of data looks at office referrals for disruption? You pick the answer that you think. You got like 10 more seconds. All right, discipline data, 13 answers. Everybody got it right. Fantastic job. For those of you who have never done Kahoot before, your score is based on how quickly you got the correct answer. That's true. So let's move on to our next one here. All right, see our leaderboard. Ooh, we've got a close one. TO is in the lead right now. Nicely done. KME, you're right behind them. It's going to be anybody's game still. So let's keep going. Number two. Standardized test scores are used as achievement data, true or false? 
standardized test scores are used as achievement data, true or false. Counselors, this is everybody's favorite thing to do. Again, once the question pops up, you'll just hit either true or false. You click your option. If you're on a phone, it'll pull up different. But if you're on the thing, it'll just click it there. 14 got it right. It is true. Check our leaderboard. Oh, we got some risers coming up. AC and SH are moving up. Theo still in the lead. I won. Both games still. Number two, number three, I can count. Data that looks at how many tardies a student has is called what? So you're looking at tardies here. Man, that was quick nine answers. Attendance, That's right. Let's check our leaderboard. Theo still hanging in. Good game. All right, number four, true or false? The passing rates of an algebra one class can be used as data. What do you think? Can you use the passing rates of algebra one class? All right, let's see. Answer is true. You can use it. And we'll eventually hear soon talk about how you can use all that. So let's see. Uh-oh, Theo fell out. KME is in first now. Last question, number five. Discipline data can include which of the following? Suspension, office referrals, classroom, or low level behaviors or all of the above. Mm. Clearly Spongebob and Patrick are thinking about this one as well. All right, let's see. It is all of the above, you guys. Everybody did fantastic. So let's take a look at our, at our leaderboard. Number three, we have third place AC, in second place TO, and in first place. By one point. You need like a drum roll. I know. KME, man, that's close. Look at that. Yeah. 4702, 4704, 4705. That's a close game. That was pretty good. Congratulations, KME. Um, your prize is in the mail. Fortunately, it's just a high five. So. <laughs> We don't have anything exciting to send you, but nicely done. That was great work. So thank you, everybody, for playing that game. It's a fun little way to have some fun there for a minute. So let's talk about collecting data. So before we, we move too far, I, I will share, in all honesty, we just showed you two great ways to, to collect data. You know, Mentimeter, that little poll where everybody put their, their thoughts about collecting data, and Kahoot both great ways to use that. And I'll get into that as well, but I did want to give that disclaimer that we did just collect data from you. Probably without you knowing, you may have known it. But. So you can definitely do that as a fun way to collect data with your kids without it just being like a boring a test or whatever they have to take. They can do it in a fun way. Absolutely. So collecting data. So collecting data, there's lots of options to help you collect data. There's not one set way to do this. Um, there's tons and tons of options out there. It doesn't have to be some over the top form of data collection. Like you don't have to go all out, spend tons of money or, or do anything crazy to collect data. Data can be fun, again, even for the students. You know, sometimes it's fun for us as educators to collect data, but even for the students, they love Kahoot. They love all these different things we're gonna show you. So there's a lot of fun ways to collect data. The big thing I wanna kind of share with you is don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel on this. There's tons of stuff out there to use. 
don't feel like you have to spend hours and hours and hours trying to come up with something. There's lots of great stuff for you to do and that we're gonna share with you. So feel free to use all this stuff. We use it, it works well, students love it. So don't stress about collecting data. We're gonna show you that it's not overwhelming or anxious or anything like that. There's a lot of great ways to do this. So let's jump into that. So ways to collect data. Mentimeter, we'll talk about that one first. This is what we did the very, very beginning of our presentation. It has a whole lot of options here. There's interactive polls, there's quizzes, there's that word cloud we did when we type in your word and it pops up. You can do quizzes that'll um, show bar graphs and show charts, all kinds of things. You can put your answers in, you can have students put their own answers in. Pretty easy to use. There's templates that are already available. So once you get into Mentimeter, you can find templates that are already made and just plug your answers in and your questions instead of what they have. So you don't even have to spend time coming up with anything. You just put your stuff in. It is free. They do have paid versions like a lot of things, but we use the free version of it. Um, but Mentimeter is a fantastic free and easy way to collect data. You can go back later and run your reports. So like the one we did, we can go see all the different words in there and kind of see what people felt. If we use the poll, we can kind of get a better idea, maybe quicker, um, but that's an option. Kahoot, like we just did, is super interactive and fun to play. Um, especially in a classroom, students love it. I know young students, kindergarten up through uh, middle school love it, but high school, they know you're collecting data probably more, but they still enjoy playing it because it's a little bit different than being in a classroom and just talking or doing a paper and pencil test. It puts a little competition in there. We saw if you're getting your scores up quickly and scoring points faster than anybody else, you know, students might get braggy and just like, oh, I'm winning and, and all that. So it can be fun for them to play. Just like Mentimeter, there's lots of pre-made Kahoot's available. So when you get into Kahoot, you can actually search things. You can find things on study skills. You can find things on uh, test taking. You can find social, emotional, things that are already made. So if you don't want to spend forever finding something, you can use it. If you want to come up with your own like we did, they're super easy to do as well. It's just you click an option, plug it in, and make it super user-friendly. Again, just like Mentimeter, it is free, but there are paid versions of this. So if you pay, you get a little bit more of the bells and whistles. But again, the free version like we use works just fine, super easy to use. And you have access to all your data reports. So once it's all done, you can run a report to see how your students scored. Um, did they do really well on the test? Did they do not so well? Things like that. So for ours, for example, we talked a lot about briefly on um, the different options for data, but student data, you know, outcome and uh, outcome, excuse me, attendance and achievement and discipline. We talked about that. We gave you a test, everybody nailed it. So that's a good way to say, hey, you know, we talked about it, so you guys learned it. Maybe you knew it on your own already, but we can kind of see that you guys learned something from us. So that's Kahoot. Again, free, easy, both of these to use. I encourage you to check them out. Our next one we're gonna talk about is Google Forms. Again, Google is fantastic. Again, it's free as well. So that makes it super fun. You can do a whole lot of different things on here. You can do pre and post tests. Again, you can use Kahoot and all that the same way. They're easy to create. Results are pretty automatic. You know, when the student enters everything and submits it, you automatically have access to a spreadsheet that has all their data information in it. Free to use. So one we use, we created a lesson on study plan how students can create a plan. So we would use it as a pretest. They'd go in, they'd answer these questions. Do you have a true or false? I have a study plan. They'd select yes or no, true or false. Do all that. There's probably, I think for ours, maybe five to seven questions. We don't overload it with questions. They take the pretest as a counselor. I can go in and look at their results and see how they what they know. And to me, it gives me an option of figuring out what I need to do next. When we're done with the lesson, they take a similar test. It's just a post test to see if my lesson worked and then I can compare that data as well. So again, free to use Google, Google Forms is pretty fantastic. And it saves all of that in your drive, so it's easy to find. Poll Everywhere, it's pretty similar to Mentimeter. It's just kind of a different source. They give a little bit more options and things they can use in the free version. Again, it's multiple choice, so you can make those ABCD questions. 
You could do the word cloud like we did. You could do a question and answer, like you type in the question, they can type in their answer. You could do surveys, uh, you could do image polls. So you could like put up five different faces, like from zero to five, one to five, how are you feeling today? You can use a quick check-in. Kids could pick four, you know, they're feeling good. One, they're not doing so well. So you can kind of see where students are to collect your data there. Again, it is free like everything else, but it does have the paid version with access to results pretty quick and easily. So that's poll everywhere. So what else we got? So some other things we got here, ways to collect data. So these are the easiest things for you to do because it's stuff you already have access to. You could look at your attendance rates. You could look at your whole school. Let's say you're a junior high, seventh and eighth grade. You could pretty much find your attendance rates pretty quickly. If you're just wanting to find for a certain grade, maybe your, how your eighth grade is doing, you probably have access to that already. Your high school gradu graduation rates, again, being in the building, you probably have access and have this stored somewhere. If you don't have it, somebody in your administration or somebody in your building probably has access to all this stuff. It's just finding that person and ask, hey, you know, I'd like to know what the graduation rate is over the past few years. Maybe you can see that, get that data. How can we improve that? So there's somebody out there that has all this. If you don't have direct access, we just say, look for it and ask around. Grains, as counselor, we can usually get pretty, pretty easy access to student grains. If not, teachers are a great option to go talk to. They have all their grades saved. Discipline data, if you're working in the office, you probably know the students who are getting the most trouble and in the office the most. You could use that as your data, but probably somewhere that is all stored somewhere. Again, you can talk with teachers, talk with administrators, talk with somebody in your building or in your corporation about this data. I would highly suggest they have it somewhere. If you don't have access, they can probably get it to you. So the data is out there. It's just asking to try and find it. For us in the EBSC, we've been fortunate um, to have a lot of great support behind us. Um, we got a grant from Lilly that kind of helped push this initiative out for us to do a lot of this data collection, and really focus on guidance lessons and, and creating all this stuff. So using all this data we're talking about and putting into action. So we have what's called a CCT member. That's our comprehensive counseling team. That's counselors, social workers, school psychologists, people from any administration, all those people kind of working together as one big team. We have what's called the CCT dashboard. This dashboard is a one-stop shop for us. Now, disclaimer, you don't have to have this. Could we do all the work we do without it? Absolutely. Does it make it easier? Yes, but you could still get this data using anything else you already have, the who, all that stuff. This is, makes it a one quick, easy place for us to find it. It talks about behavior. There's assessment data on there. You can look at credit deficiencies, attendance, you can look at a whole wide range of things. Again, it isn't required to collect the data, to analyze it or to share it, but it's super helpful. So just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like, if I was to log in and pull up my dashboard, it looks something like this. So this is what I would see. Again, you can tell there's a whole lot on here. And again, not required, but I can look at attendance rates from the last seven days for my school compared to other schools. Um, down in the very bottom, I can run quick reports. There's a lot of different reports we can run, attendance, discipline, all that stuff, um, standardized test scores. There's just an, a lot of data we could look at. So that's kind of what we do. Um, our, the dashboard, our platform, what platform does our dashboard use? You know, I'm going to be honest, I don't know that answer, um, but I can definitely would love to find out that somebody downtown takes care of all that for us and they just plug it in. And what's great is sometimes if it's a report that we would like to have and it's not in there, we could reach out to them and they are pretty awesome at finding that data for us. So the exact platform they use, I don't know. We just know that Decision Ed is what, what it's called. So maybe that's the platform, um, but we'll go with that. But I'll, I'll definitely love to find out and give you the exact answer, but I will say Decision Ed and hope I'm right. So we'll do that. Uh, again, a lot of great stuff in there, but to kind of drill it down a little bit more. So let's say I want to focus on my attendance in my building or in a certain grade level. I can go and run a report just for attendance, and here's what I can see. So 
with our attendance, we can look at who's missed like zero to five days, five to seven days, um, more than seven days, 10 days, over 10 days, and all that stuff. So I click it, it runs this report for me, and it tells me everything I need to know about them. It'll tell me uh, on the far side, their grade level. So on the far side over there, it says grade level. In the middle where it's blurred out or blacked out, it would say their names, so I could have access to that in their student information. It'll tell me if they're special ed or not. Um, tell me how long they've been enrolled in the school. So if they've been enrolled the whole year, 137 is more familiar, more like that. If they're somewhat in the middle, like we get students who transfer in from out of county, it'll tell me that. If they moved in just last few weeks and have attendance issues, it'll tell me that as well. Next to that, it tells me the attended quality. So how many times they've attended. So if I look up there, like the first kid has been enrolled for 137 days, has attended 132. In my head, I know that's five, but right next to it, it tells me absence number, five days. Um, it gives you the attendance rate for each student, their absent rate. And again, that very last column, number of days, gives that five to seven. So I can pull this real quick for any number of absences, and it's pretty awesome that I can just pull that up. So we're thankful to have that. Can you find this without it? Again, yes. It just might take a little bit more work to figure out who has that data, but I'm sure somebody in your corporation has this kind of data, who's tracking attendance, so it's definitely something you can find. So that's what attendance looks like for us. Um, we also have an at-risk data report that we can run, which is pretty awesome. This takes a whole lot of things into consideration and gives us this fancy color-coded thing here. Um, Green, just for quick reference, green means they're doing good. They're not, not a risk for you know, failing or anything like that. Yellow, kind of they're in the borderline, definitely a medium risk that somebody need to look at. Uh, and then red is a high risk that somebody I really should focus some time on and maybe do something with. So it looks at their attendance rate, the days of out of school suspension, uh, their grades for English and math, so it's like those are the, the big two. It'll give me their NWA scores and things like that later down the line as well. But it, this is great, so I can run this real quick. It gives them a score and I have a C. Oh, you know, I wanna know how my fifth grade's doing. I could pull this report and look at my fifth grade and maybe say, okay, well, half of my fifth grade is in yellow, half of them are, and the other half's in red. Hopefully they're not gonna be like that, but that wouldn't be very good. Um, but I could use that data to say who I need, or if it's mostly green and there's 10 kids in red, well, those 10 kids probably need some kind of attention. And that's what I would use with my data. So yeah, Audrey double checked, it is decision ed, so good. So that's what we have. Again, I know I'm gonna keep hitting on this, but you don't need this data. Um, you need the data, but you don't need the platform like we have. A dashboard is fantastic for us, but there's ways to get all this data without needing it. So don't look at this and go, well, we don't have that dashboard, so there's no way we can do this. For years, we didn't have it either, and we still were able to deliver great guidance lessons and support our students in great ways. This just makes it a little bit easier for us to do it real quick, but you can still do all this stuff without it. So don't take away that, oh, well, I have to have a dashboard to do this. You don't. And I do think there's a benefit if you don't have something like this and showing it to the data guru at your in your district and saying, is there anything that we can have that's similar to this? Is there any, are there any widgets? Cause that's what they're using is widgets that we can have that would help us to access something similar and they might be able to work something out. Maybe not to this level, but um, to something that would be helpful for you to save you time. Yeah. And while Kahoot and Mentimeter and all those other ones, Google are fantastic. They can do all this stuff. It's just not gonna look hundred percent like this, but there's ways to probably go in and, and tweak it that you can add the different color codes for things you can do it on your own. So you can still use what you have out there, use those free versions. There's a lot of other free things out there as well. I just kind of focused on what we use typically a lot with us to get that access. So that's a lot about collecting data. And so I know when, when you collect data, you're like, okay, well, now, now what do we do, right? We've collected all this data. We've got tons and tons of data. I have this whole dashboard at my fingertips. What do I do with all this? That's a good question. And again, it can be overwhelming. So when you collect it, it's okay to step back and kind of relax and breathe or have other people help you look at that. But our next step, what we do is we analyze all of our data. So what will we do with this data? 
Well, there's a lot of options. There's, you know, those tier one lessons, doing a whole group lesson in the classroom, going into each class, maybe each grade level, it's a lesson on studying, maybe one class needs a lesson on attendance, maybe the whole school. Again, that's your tier one, the whole school would need something on attendance or the whole school needs something on bowling. That could be something you could see in your, in your data. Maybe you notice looking at the graduation rate that it's not as high as you would hope. There's you know, some people who aren't doing what they should be doing and, and passing and moving on. That can be your small group lesson, your tier two. You get like a small group of students together and, and work with them. Or you can see that, hey, you know, that, that at-risk thing I pulled up, I see that couples, one kid maybe isn't doing very well or a couple kids, instead of doing a small group with them, it could be that tier three one-on-one -on -one lesson with them as well. Or I could take this data and say, hey, community, hey, building administration, here's what we have. We need support in helping make sure students are at school every day. How do we do that? We take that data and analyze it with them and share it. We'll get into that share part later, but those are all great options there. So I know that's a lot to take in, um, especially with data, especially if you put that data makes you nauseous and all that. That's a lot of data I'd read through at you, but don't be scared because it's a fantastic way to collect it and analyze it. So we're going to move on, kind of show you some more stuff. Yep. Okay, so. Um... This is the multi-tiered, multi-domain um, system of support with school counseling. Um, this is kind of where we guide all of our decision making. And so we wanted to collect data as far as to see um, where our areas of need are. So we did an activity as our district. And I just wanted to share this activity with you because this was, um, as a district, what we used as a starting point. This was data that we collected to um, to see where we needed to start when it came to their curriculum writing. So what we did was we have these different colored post-it notes and each one in the CCT had different colors. So school counselors are pink, um, social workers were blue and school psychologists were purple. And so what we did was we wrote down activities on post-it notes to um, see, and we put them in the correct category. So for example, if I am doing an academic small group, then that would be academic tier two, and I would put a post-it note in the academic tier two um, section of this little um, pyramid. So this is an activity that I think is very helpful. And so um, we're gonna just kind of do a smaller version of this activity here together. Um, the idea again is to collect data from yourself about where you're spending most of your time. So what this also shows you is that we're not just collecting data from students, we also can collect data from our colleagues and from ourselves. This could even be something that you do on your own just to see where the gaps are. Um, and you can see from our chart, our gaps fell there in the middle under college and career tier two and tier three. We did not have a lot of supports that we were putting in place for college and career. So this activity kind of told us that that's where we needed to start, it, start with our curriculum writing. It also helps to see what everybody else is doing. I know we may not have like the psychologists and social workers with us today. We might have a few, but for us, it was nice to see that others are spending a lot of time on the, the social emotional piece. And for counselors, while we want to hit that as well, we can clearly see there's other areas that need our support, like the, the college and career and the academics that need a little bit of support. It's also a great resource for you as counselors. If you do this, you could take this to your administration and say, Here's where I'm spending all my time. Um, here's where we need to focus on some other stuff. Maybe on your end, you're really heavy on academics and college and career, but the social emotional piece is lacking. You can take this and say, look, this is what I see that's going on. This is what I know we're doing in our building, in our district. Here's what we need to focus on. So this is a great, simple, easy way to collect data about what you do as well. And this activity we got from Trish, Trish Hatch, which um, Alan had brought up earlier. All right, so we're going to give you time, time to do this. So we need to leave that up so we can scan it. I'm going to put it in the link for you real quick. Okay, so you can scan that QR code or you can just go to um, that shorten, the URL shorten, shortener there. Um, and essentially, we're just going to write a few things that you do um, as a school counselor on one of those sticky notes and just move it into the correct um, area. If you scan it from your phone, if you're working on the phone and you scan it or go to the go to the website, it will ask you to download Google 
uh, slides to do this. It works a whole lot easier if you're on a computer. So if you're on your computer and you go to this, it should be a whole lot easier, but we'll pull it up as well so you guys can see what it looks like on our end. All right, so here's what it looks like. Some of you guys, anonymous Kiwi. Well, the thing that's awesome about Google Slides is it makes you anonymous people. So feel free to change it. If you do it from your computer, again, it's going to be a lot easier. If you're on your phone and you do it, try to like make it smaller and type in all of it. It can get challenging. And I know I mentioned the post-it colors earlier. Don't worry about that. That was just because we had so many um, different types of people in our meetings, whereas I think most of us are still fine. So any color is fine. Yeah, so we'll kind of add some in here with you guys. There's a lot of good stuff going on. Mm -hmm. One thing we'll make sure to do as well is this is going to be, when we have the slides, we'll get access to this as well. So you can take this to your building, your administration, your cohort of counselors, if you have that, take this and do this. It's just a super fun way to kind of do things. And you can do it the other way as well. Like take the big, huge post-it note paper like we did, draw on there, write it down and put it on. That's a little bit easier. Um, this is the kind of virtual way of doing things. We'll give everybody a little bit longer to do this. Just not a whole lot more time, but I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to check this out and see it. If there's somebody trying to get it on their phone and all that, it's a great activity. If you can do it in person, it makes it sometimes a little bit more fun because you get to actually talk with other counselors and everybody who's there. Like, oh, you guys do that? That's really cool. Or, oh, I didn't know that the cell specialist was doing this, or I didn't know school psychologist did that. Sometimes it's cool to see what they're doing because sometimes we don't see all that in person so and honestly this is such a great advocacy tool um, that you can show your like alan mentioned you could show your administrators but also a lot of teachers don't know what we do and so if you had something like this in your um office that you could show them whenever they're asking you know what what we're doing or if we are available for something um this is just a great way for people to see what you do so this goes into the sharing piece as well absolutely i think sometimes as counselors we're just thinking People might think all we do is deal with that, that crisis moment in the moment when there's a whole lot of other things that we do to support mm -hmm. our students and our building. This is a great way to show that, like Audrey said. So, 
definitely use this if you can. All right, looks like we've, we've kind of got everybody. Again, it's gonna be there. So if you wanna come back to it later and add in, you're absolutely welcome to. Or make it, if you wanna make a copy of this and um, clear it out and start over, that would be good too. Well, that's you a great idea. You do it on your own. All right, so let's keep moving on. All right, so um, I am going to walk you through the steps that I took um, whenever I was deciding um, how to do an intervention for academics. So I'm gonna walk you through kind of all six steps of the data collection and analyzing, um, which is honestly a lot of repeat, collect data, analyze, collect data, data, analyze, back and forth. So I'm gonna walk you through each step of that um, with a specific example. So. My step one there was I was collecting data from the whole group, okay? So what that means by the whole group is I work with just eighth graders. So I just looked at our entire group of eighth graders and saw kind of where everyone stood academically. And I'm gonna go into more detail about that in a little bit. Um, and then step two, I'm gonna analyze that data to figure out what is needed, okay? Do I need, is it so much or so many students that we need a classroom guidance lesson um, because you know 80% or more of the students needed it? Or is it something that I could accomplish in a small group setting? So that's kind of where I make that decision. Um, I had decided in this example that I was gonna go with a small group. So once I had my small group determined, I'm gonna collect data again through a pretest. So this is data that I'm collecting from the students with that pretest to see where their starting point is um, as far as attitudes. Um, and then I'm going to analyze that data to kind of help me decide what my lessons are going to look like. Um, after I deliver those lessons, I'm going to give that post-test, which is actually going to be the same test as my pre-test. And then that last step would be to analyze to see if that lesson was effective. And if it wasn't, like, what are my next steps with these students? And this isn't on there because there's a whole other part, but the last step there is going to be that I'm going to share my results um, with stakeholders. A lot of opportunities to collect data. And a lot of opportunities to analyze it, but it's all an important part just to make sure our students are getting the best support they can. Okay, so I'm going to go through each one of those steps um, like a little piece at a time. So the example I'm giving um, was when it came to grades. I was looking at grades. We noticed that we had a lot of students with um, Fs, Bs or Fs in core subjects. So when I was trying to decide if I'm going to form groups, I looked at my data sources. The first thing I looked at was the failure report, which um, is a list that we get at the end of the grading period that says how many students failed classes. So I looked at that, that's achievement data. And I looked at that to determine like what my small group would be. But what I discovered was that it wasn't quite enough for it to be a classroom guidance lesson, but it was too many students for an effective small group. So I needed to narrow that list down a little more. And so that's when I compared it with the high risk report that Alan talked about earlier. So I looked at who was not on track to possibly graduate in the future from that high risk report. And if they were also on my failure report, that's how I narrowed it down. So you can use it to narrow down to decide who's gonna be in your small groups. Um, or, you know, Another approach could be that you're gonna look for people that are not on the high risk report because they're getting supports elsewhere. It just kind of depends on your school setup and what kind of supports are already in place. Okay, so then after that, I'm gonna analyze that group. So I made a list of um, students with three or more Fs in the core subjects. And like I mentioned before, I compared that list to the kids on the high risk report. And then since I still had more than what would be acceptable for a small group, um, I got input from a team. So in my school, we have an MTSS team where we meet every other week. And so I said, okay, these are the kids. What supports are they getting elsewhere? And that way we were able to determine which groups or which kids would be a good fit for my group. All right. So this is the part where I collected data from the kids. Like, so I've already picked my groups at this point. So this is the point where I'm going to collect data from the kids. So this is just an example of like Alan mentioned earlier, which was the Google form. Um, and I just asked them some questions. This was, um, this was in related relation to their attitudes about school. So 
How important is goal setting to you? How organized are you? So this is kind of their personal opinions about themselves. So this was my pre and post assessment. So this is me collecting data from the students through a Google form. And then I used Google as well to come up with some graphs that would help me really see where the need was. So from these, this is just two graphs that I chose to show you, but um, this was after I collected data from my kids and I saw that they think that grades are very important. However, they don't feel confident um, in their abilities to study and prepare for tests. So that told me that these are kids that really want to get the other grades up, but they just aren't really sure where to start. And so study skills was what I focused on for my instruction with them in my small group. Going back to Google Forms, the great thing is once you collect all that data, you can go into your form and like see results and break it down. And Google can actually make this chart for you. Like you don't have to go in and figure out how to make your own chart and graph. Google can do it for you. So mm -hmm. if you're not comfortable with making that stuff. That's even more reason to use something like that because it's already done for you. All right. So we're kind of going to, we talked about how to analyze data. There's a lot of good ways to do that. Now we're going to talk about why it's important to share that data. So you've collected it using one of the numerous ways or a different way. You've analyzed it. You've done all, all the collecting and analyzing. Now it's time to share it. So what do I share? We're going to start kind of with the four W's, the who, what, when, and where. We'll talk about student perception of this and then the results or, or the so what. Maybe somebody, you tell people, hey, I did a lesson on this and their response is, okay, so what? What happened? So that's what we're going to focus on in sharing out your data. So starting out with the four W's. Uh, first, we have who. So these are the students that, that you, you did this lesson with. Who were they? What grade was it? How many students? So for us, maybe looking at attendance, we did lessons on attendance for all students in grade K through five. So if I'm gonna share my data out and say, the data shows that attendance isn't very important or a lot of kids aren't attending in elementary school. So I'm gonna do a lesson just focusing on all the students in K through five. I could have, if it was just in the third grade, I could do just the third grade. So that's an easy way to talk about who this is for. What, what am I addressing? That's a simple and easy one right there. What are you doing? Well, I'm looking at attendance again. So I can do one classroom guidance lesson on the importance of attendance in each class, each homeroom. So if I have two kindergarten homerooms, I'm gonna go into both of those uh, and so forth in first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. One lesson, the same lesson for all of them. Um, now, if you need to tweak it a little bit to fit that grade level, that's obviously okay, but the, they're all getting the same material on why attendance is important. The next W we talk about is when. When did this happen? Did I do this at a certain time? For us, we did this lesson delivered in September. It's attendance month, so we figured why not tie it in the same time frame. So this is still early in the school. School starts about in August, middle of August or so. September, they're still fresh in the school. So it's kind of important to start bringing that in now of why attendance is important. That last W we got is the where. Where was this done? Was it done in the office? Was it done in the classroom? Was it done? the library, anything like that. Again, for us, it was presented in each homeroom in kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, virtually, it looks a little bit different. So the, the where might say virtually in the classroom, uh, but if you're in the building, you could say where you did this, what class, you could say the teacher, grade level, anything like that. So now that you got the four Ws, we'll talk about the student perception of this. You're gonna share that information as well. So it looks at the attitudes and behaviors of the student. What did they get from this? Well, how was this impactful to them? So again, attendance. So we might say, you know, these are just so these are just results I came up with. I'm not saying this is 100% our results yet. So we can say before the lesson, 48% of students believe attendance mattered. Now 75 believe it mattered. So you can kind of see that the belief and the attitude they have is that they they have a better feeling of why it's important. Did the students learn any new skills? Well, hopefully they did. So for attendance, I can say 97% of K-5 students understand the impact of missing school. I can see that from my data. Maybe one of my questions on my pretest is, is attending school important? Some of them, maybe to start the pretest, they put kind of, and then after the, the test, when they do the post-test, they put, yes, it's very important. So I can gauge, well, they learned something that, or maybe attendance wasn't as important before to them, but now it is. 
Did they learn any knowledge? Was anything learned in this lesson? Again, we're hoping it is, but we can say using the pre post test shows us what students learned to show our lesson was successful. Again, going back to the, the new skill, if students said it wasn't important, but now they say it is, I can use that as they learn something or why is it important to be at school? Well, if you're part of the lesson maybe talks about if you're not at school, you miss out on curriculum and then you're farther behind and things like that. So they learn if I'm not here, I miss something that I might need later. So it's important for me to be here now to learn everything. All right, so the last part here with the so what, um, the, the primary purpose, can you click it one more time? Um, the primary purpose, in my opinion, is that you, the purpose of sharing it out is to advocate for your profession. So whenever you're collecting data and you have all this really helpful data, if you just keep it all to yourself, no one knows what you're doing and no one knows the impact you're having on kids. So whenever I did my grades small group, I had a small group of 10 and I spent one grading period meeting once a week with these kids. I collected data from them with a pre and post assessment as well as their grades. So I had two pieces of data, which was their attitudes and opinions from the survey and then their grades as well. Um, and then I was able to take that information and share it out. Um, and I, I shared it with my principal. Thankfully, my principal is very data driven and is um, very, you know, if you have a good reason for wanting something, he is very flexible. So I was able to show him uh, the effectiveness of my small group. And then as a result, from me being able to advocate and say, hey, this amount of time that I spent on the small group is really important. He um, took away one of my duties. As a result, he said, okay, you don't have to be in the self-reg room anymore, but I want you to spend that time being able to pull more small groups. So this grading period, I'm actually pulling five small groups. Um, and I'm able to do that because I had this data to back up what I was doing with my principal. So being able to show that it changed an attitude or belief that, that students learn new skills um, is a great way to advocate for your job and make sure that um, the time that you're spending is valuable. So to kind of tie into that, so again, we've been talking about how to share data. We looked at attendance. So maybe at the end of the year, I could say overall attendance improved from 75% last year to 90% this year. Now, if you're an administrator and your counselor comes to you and tells you this kind of data after doing all these lessons and showing you how important it is and that prior to this, the attendance was terrible, kids learned why it's important, and now they're here and the, the data shows that. To me, that, that speaks volume, but that's pretty important. And so that's good data to use. And like Audrey said, that's a great way to advocate for yourself and your, your role. I mean, some, like in the, she said earlier, teachers don't even know always what we do. This is a great way to share that with them. You could share that with anybody. It could be your building. You could share that with your administrators, your teachers. You can share that with family. You can share that with community. There's, there's a lot of people you can share that with to get, to get your information out there and show what you do. I'm glad that you mentioned the teachers piece because that's another part that was helpful is some teachers were really kind of hesitant to let me pull their kids out of class, um, especially if I'm pulling them out because they're failing classes and then I'm pulling them out of their classes. To them, that didn't make sense. So whenever I was able to show them the data of, if they have these study skills in place, they're going to be learning more in your class, even though they're missing a little bit of it. So being able to advocate with the teachers as well so that they can kind of understand why you're needing to pull kids out is helpful. All right, so how do we share this data? So we got all this data, what do we do with it? All right, so sharing it out there, you wanna make sure you share it out with as many stakeholders as possible. So um, meetings with administrators to show the importance of what you're doing. That's the example that I gave earlier. Um, I'm really lucky that my assistant principal and I work very closely, so she kind of always knows what I'm doing. Um, but my principal is also flexible enough that if I schedule a meeting with him, I can definitely pop in there and show him how I'm doing, and he is always excited to see data. So I think that scheduling meetings with administrators and making sure that they also know what you're doing um, is very helpful. Um, an advisory council, that is something that we had to put in place for RAMP that we had never done before. Um, whenever we were applying for ramp, we went ahead and got that started. And it is, it, it's, it's actually really helpful. I was a little hesitant about it, um, but getting some people from outside the school to see what you're doing and give you feedback is very valuable, um, especially when you have community partners involved. 
um, and other people that work with kids in a non-school setting is, you know, you come, sometimes you don't get to see that other perspective until you pull those people in. And then sharing it out um, through social media, email, and your school website is helpful as well. Um, and I'm not, sometimes that can feel a little awkward, like sharing out data and saying, oh, look what I accomplished this semester. Like that feels kind of awkward, but we, we really tried to do that this year and the feedback we got was really positive. Um, and then a flashlight presentation. Um, the purpose is to shine a light on your program. So I'm gonna show you um, an example of a flashlight presentation that we created at North Junior. Before we do that, so yeah. people might wonder what who gets an advisory council. So Audrey, who's, oh, yeah. who's in your advisory council? Um, our sure advisory that. council, we invited our CCP. So at our school, we have um, a psychologist, a school social worker, um, a cell specialist, um, which that's new this year, our cell specialist, and then um, our administrators. And then we made sure we included some teachers and parents. And then um, our site council, um, but like we had a YMCA representative um, that came as well. So you can find anybody that is part of this. If you don't have that, the school psychologist in the building or the social worker in the building, there's probably one in your district somewhere or somebody that could fill that role. So make sure you find somebody to fill that. Um, of course, your administrator and then your community partner. I mean, there's a huge amount of resources in the community. Just find somebody in that community that you can vouch for. Even like a parent might be a great idea as well to add in there. Um, this way they know what's going on. And they can be that voice. Sometimes a parent hearing it from another parent is kind of a little bit more supportive than the teachers and the admin saying, here, here's what we're doing. But if you're a parent, another parent comes to you and say, hey, here's what they're doing. Here's how they've impacted the school. It's, it kind of carries a little bit more weight. So I would actually recommend the PTA president. That's that a, person is very usually pretty linked in with all the parents. Um, so the PTA president is a good place to start. Um, and then also making sure that you, well, an, an option would be that you could include counselors from, un, like maybe invite a counselor from another school just to get a counselor perspective of somebody that doesn't really know your building that well. I know I got invited to um, another school's advisory council last year. So it was kind of cool to see a different perspective there. So let's get into this flashlight here. So this was the flashlight that we just shared out um, in December, or we shared it out during school council week. Um, so we included our, um, kind of our, the abstract or summary is, talks about our goals. Um, we have our objectives and our mission statement and then the primary activity. So I try, we try to keep it brief um, because we know that people aren't gonna read something that's really long. So we tried to just keep it brief, which is why it's a flashlight presentation. But we talked about how we do classroom guidance lessons for all students. We do small group tier two interventions. And then um, we do the short-term solution focused counseling. Um, and then we put our goal in there was to, our, our principal really wanted us to focus this year on academics. So our goal was to decrease the number of students getting B or Fs in core subjects, which is why I ended up doing those small groups. So even though in this, we don't quite have the results from the small groups yet, as far as how much better they're doing as a result of our small groups, we were able to share out that the percentage of students we were able to see in small groups increased from 3% to 21%. And again, that goes back to, I, we were able to do that because I advocated to have that extra time to work on it when they got rid of my duty. Um, and then the part on the right is kind of where you're just kind of bragging about ourselves. And like I said, that's really hard for some of us to do, but I think it's important for people to know what we're doing and what we're accomplishing and we're working hard. And again, while she said the data for what's going on right now isn't in there, that's a great way to use those other resources like your email, your 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 school Facebook page, your own um, sitting on emails and newsletters and, and all that great stuff is a way to get that information out there. And then maybe when it's all done, you have that next flashlight and say, hey, here's here was our goal. Here's what we did to kind of show off a little bit. So. And we shared this on our school Facebook page as well. And our principal sent it out to all the parents in um, his newsletter. And then um, when I sent it out to the teachers, I kind of made a point to say, think, you know, as Thanks to you and you allowing me to remove to take your kids from your class every once in a while, we are able to accomplish this. And so that kind of puts it on them a little bit of like, we really appreciate you letting us do this. It's great to let everybody know what's going on. So. And then we will definitely make another one at the end of the year showing um, like the percentage of improvement from grades as well. So it doesn't have to just be a once a year thing. 
So we've talked about ways to collect data. There's, there's tons and tons of different ways out there. Again, Mentimeter, Kahoot, all those are fun things. A lot of them are fun because it makes kids feel like you're, they're not doing anything but having fun playing a game. So that's a great way to do that. Plus it's engaging, students love it. And, and even as an educator, I love playing Kahoot. So sometimes it's fun where I'll play the games with them, even though I might know the answers. Um, so it gives you a little sometimes fun if you want to win and have fun with the class and be like, I'll beat you, all that stuff. You can, you can kind of have fun with them. Um, analyzing it, it's quick and easy to do. You just figure out your data, figure out what you want to look at and pull it and look at it. Can that be sometimes mind numbing and, and uh, overwhelming? overwhelming? Yeah, absolutely. Because it's a lot to look at. Don't feel like you have to do that by yourself. You know, feel like somebody else you can do that with. Like, like Audrey said, go to your administration and say, here's the kids who are failing math. Um, what should we do? Like, here's my thought. Let's have a small group for these kids because they're failing and they're at risk for failing in high school as well. So find somebody you can do that with. If you have other counselors in your building, talk to them. If you have other counselors in your corporation, you can talk to them. You can even talk to counselors in other corporations and say, here's the data we have. What do you, do you guys see this? How do you guys deal with this? It's okay to use each other as support. So that's the great thing to do. And then sharing it is, is huge, like we've talked about. It's a way to fight for your program, a way for you to, to get not necessarily out of duty, but to say, here's where my time could be spent improving the school better than maybe doing lunch duty, I could be doing small groups to help our kids deal with grades or study habits, or maybe you don't have anybody working on social emotional stuff. And we know how huge mental health is right now. We could be helping support students that way. There's a lot of great things, but all this is gonna end up working to benefit your program, benefit your school and the students, which I think is a top priority, so. And I think if you're, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed by the amount of data that's available, I say just choose one place to start I think that part of um, when people do get overwhelmed, it's because there's too much data available for you. So I think just saying, just narrowing it down and saying, there's a lot that needs to be done, but I don't have time to do it all. Um, and I'm overwhelmed. I'm just going to start with this one data piece for now. I think that would be a good start. And then once you start to get comfortable, you can add on and start looking at other sources of data as well. Yeah, kind of jumping back real quick, back to this slide, you know, for, for us, we had to figure out what we were already doing and we were doing a lot, but there's a lot here in the middle that we weren't doing. And I think it was clear to us, we, we can't fix this in a year. This is a time thing. We've worked on this for the last three, four years now and slowly, but making it better. We continue to update lessons. We continue to get new lessons in there, continue to add tier two lessons, continue to even as counselors, reach out to other counselors and get their data input. Like, what do you need? What do you think the students need? Is there a tier two that we need to add? Is there a tier one that we've made that we need to tweak on? And that's stuff we're continually to work on. It's a process. It's not gonna be a one and done. I pulled the data, I did the small group, life is fixed. You're gonna to continue to work on this and eventually it's gonna get better and better. I mean, that's where we're at now. We feel like we're, we're doing a great job, but we still got room for improvement. If we did this chart again, there might be things that we can see like we need to go back and continue to add more tier one support for college and career or tier three and things like that. So this is a great starting point like we did. There's a lot of great things out there. But again, like Audrey said, don't feel like you have to fix the world right now. It takes time and that's OK. All right. Well, any questions, anything like that? I know we, we filled your brains with a lot of information. A lot of ways to use data and see data and analyze it and all that. But any questions? I mean, feel free to ask whatever. We're happy yeah, to you help. You can unmute yourself to ask questions or just type it in the chat. If you have questions that you don't want to share, feel free to email us. Our emails are on there. We'll be happy to, to answer. Nobody? everybody on screen break and people are quiet so. <laughs> here we go we have one added to the chat all this for fun data collecting surveys in elementary yeah absolutely so i spent a lot of time with elementary um could they love kahoot i mean because it's a blast or so, i mean i'm gonna so this wasn't part of it but I, i'll pull up kahoot real quick so this is well, if i could type kahoot in right this is what kahoot looks like um obviously you have to sign in but See if it'll let me sign in real quick. 
there's a lot of great things. The students I do cahoots with, they love them because they're fun. They're easy. I mean, it's a game for them. They can do it on their iPad, their tablet. They can do it um, all sorts of ways. But so like, here's the, here's the library. Let's say I want to do something on, this is my library. I've done some, tons of different things on study plan, roles of the school counselor. So I did one on, because kids didn't know what I did. So I went in one day and did about that. They had a blast because it just was something different they could do. Discovery kind of talked about, there's a lot of stuff on here. Um, like social emotional stuff, not social studies. Mm -hmm. But I mean, literally you could type anything you want in here and find things and the kids love it. Like you can tweak it and add these fancy videos and GIFs and pictures and make it as kiddie as you want. There's a lot of other things you can use too. Um, I mean, to be honest, you're real young, kindergarten for a second, Google Forms and all that is kind of boring to them because it was going in and it feels like a test. Um, yeah, this is going to feel more like a game. This feels like so. a game, yeah. And then Mintimeter and stuff, sometimes that's fun for them. Another thing that sometimes I use, um, it's called Flipgrid, and I can show you that real quick. Um, but it's like, you know, it's like a video recording thing. And so I can go in and post a question to my students and then have them answer it back. I won't go into you because there's kids on there. But so I asked the kids this before I read, I talked about a whole lesson on ways to deal with stress. And if they're nervous about testing, what can you do? And I shared some different ways in the video. And then they made a video reply back to me. Um, it's really cool because they're third graders. And they're like, if I get nervous, I'll remember to breathe. Or one girl told me she puts her hands like this and like does butterfly hugs. And it's something her parents taught her. And it was really cool because I've never heard of that. But they had a blast. And so when they came in to take I read in person, they saw me and they talked about that video. Like, hey, Miss Richard, did you see my video? I'm like, yeah, I, I replied back. And I always make a video reply back to them just to kind of make it more engaging. And they love it. It's just a fun way to do things. So there's lots of fun ways to do things. It's just finding it. So elementary, I, again, I'd say more, but Kahoot and games like that, because it doesn't feel like a test, it's like work. And afterwards, there are reports that Kahoot generates um, that tells you like how each kid did on the, like if it was an assessment, um, it would kind of give you some, doesn't it give you charts and stuff? It does. Let's see. Sometimes it takes a little bit. I don't know if the one we just gave you is done or not. That would be awesome because then we can tell you live how well you did, but everybody knows how you did. I mean, you got them all right. <laughs> but yeah, that's a fun way. There's right there's reports. Here's my types of data, so I can open it real quick. And look, perfection, I mean, two players, but this could be an older one. So I, I did play this earlier, made sure it worked. But you can kind of see, well, out, me and Audrey both played. <laughs> I beat Audrey, not, not, not that it's a game. It's not a competition between us, but I did. Um, and just kind of get all this great stuff. I can go for each question and see, you know, what people answered. So if they got them wrong, I could see that. I could see how long it takes them to answer. All that great stuff and then there's feedback as well so a lot of good stuff for kahoot so yes it's exciting and feels like a game but secretly i'm collecting data on you and you don't know it so anything else you're welcome hopefully none of you are sitting on the beach just enjoying this beautiful you're on spring break and you know relaxing you're like, let's wrap it up. If you're here in Evansville, it's raining, so it's not that much fun here for us. Well, thank you guys so much. We appreciate it. If you have any questions or anything, feel free to email us anytime. We'll be happy to answer and help any way we can. Again, I'll be honest, we're not experts on all this, but we're doing the best we can, and we're learning every day. So if you have a question, we'll definitely be happy to help anyway. So. Amanda, I'll give it back to you if you wanted that. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, this was great. A lot of great information, resources, tools. Really appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, on this slide here, this is a Google folder that was created during session one. So I know our first session presenters added some resources, possibly session two presenters did as well. So you can go back and um, take a look and access um, some things here. Uh, obviously, session one, we uh, had some presenters talking about comprehensive school counseling, giving kind of a very high level overview. 
Session two, we talked about tiered interventions and support. And then of course, this session, we talked about uh, a lot about data and results and then sharing those results. So please feel free to go back. I know this was a very high level series um, of comprehensive school counseling. Next year, we may get even a little bit more um, deep into each of these topics and the different components of comprehensive school counseling. So hopefully you will join us for those. I added to the chat our session evaluation link. Please uh, fill this out. This is how we gather feedback. Um, your input is really important. It helps us plan for um, upcoming future sessions. Additionally, when you fill this out, you will be able to access your professional growth plan point for today's session. Or if you're an active member of INSWA, you can also request a CEU. Um, through this session evaluation. So please fill that out. Again, the link is in the chat if you wanna access that. Next, I want to ask you, remind you, you may have already seen some things go out about this. We are um, collecting data right now. We've put out a Counselor Connect needs assessment. This information that we collect, it helps us determine next year's priority topics for professional learning. So share with us what you need, we will be looking at this and really um, figuring out how to address each of these needs through professional learning next year. So your input again here is very important. Additionally, how do you like to learn? Is it in person? Is it virtually combination? Is it through a course? Some of these questions are asked on the uh, assessment. So please take just five minutes to fill this out. The deadline is this Friday and you will be entered to win a couple of different fun things. So please, um, please do fill this out when you can. Finally, I wanna share some upcoming events. We have a um, planning for college series that is going to be taking place in April and May. So that will be an exciting one. We have an, um, a session on STEM and employability skills. Session four in our culturally responsive SEL series will take place on April 20th. And then finally, the virtual Keep Indiana Learning Conference is June 14th and 15th. Registration for the conference is only $25. And we have some amazing presenters. The content from the conference will be available for a year after the live two dates. So if you're not able to attend June 14th and 15th, maybe you will be on vacation. It will be the start of your summer break then sign up anyway so that you can then access all of those sessions whenever it's convenient for you through June of 2023. So be sure to check that out. With that, I'm going to say thank you very much for joining us again, and we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you again to our amazing presenters from today, and hope you all have a wonderful spring break. Take care, everybody. Thanks, everybody.